Thank you, David, and welcome everyone here to IBIS at the uh, University of Aberystwyth. It's a great pleasure to, to welcome Caroline Drummond here today. Uh, she is the Chief Executive Officer of uh, LEAF, linking the environment and farming. I, I owe Caroline and the, uh, the LEAF organisation a, a great deal. Um, having been in agricultural education and research uh, for the last, I don't know, 28 years, I suppose, um, LEAF, in the, ba in the bad old days of the 1980s and 1990s, was the, the real um, leader in providing an acceptable face, as far as the public were concerned, in terms of agriculture, which in those days was suffering from bad press in terms of grain mountains, pollution, subsidies, uh, and all sorts of bad press. And, and LEAF really gave a, a, a great um, innovation and a, a start for farmers to actually demonstrate that they were making a significant contribution uh, to the environment and to land use, employability, the countryside, and all the amenity areas as well as the environment. In addition to the essential, as we now recognise, a role that agriculture in the UK and particularly in Wales has for uh, food security. Uh, I also owe Caroline and Leaf a, a great deal because we use Leaf Farm so much in our own demonstration work and uh, the farms are used not only for public engagement and accessibility but a great deal for students to learn <laughs> and to uh, see how they should be managing their own farms in a sustainable way. Um, in terms of uh, this particular event and the programmes, uh, IBAS is very much uh, contributing to the low carbon economy and the environment agenda and we're very delighted to be involved in that programme here in Wales. In terms of the particular areas that we'll be talking about this morning, it's in the area of sustainable intensification. Uh, since the food price spikes in the 2008, it's now become uh, very much more acceptable to mention that you're into agricultural research uh, in polite conversation. And, uh, and, but it is within that framework. We do need to intensify uh, because of the population and the demands of that population for food uh, is increasing, uh, yet the, ar the area for agricultural land is not increasing by definition. We need to produce more from the same area, which is a definition of intensification, a very bad word, it has all sorts of poor connotations, but if we combine it with sustainability, which is a nice soft cuddly word, uh, we might get away with it. But they are things that we need to focus on. We do need to intensify, but it has to be done in a sustainable way. And Wales has a very real and important part to play in that sustainable intensification agenda. Uh, we are one of the most productive parts of the world for producing and sequestering carbon in our crops because we rely so much on perennial crops, particularly grass and the legumes that are there all year round. They can capture the sunlight, sequester carbon all year round. They're not ploughing up the soil routinely, which causes problems with carbon release and the disruption of soil profile and soil fauna. Um, and we can produce very efficient uh, biomass, which we then need to use efficiently and much of the research that we do here at IBAS uh, tries to ensure that all of that carbon is used as efficiently as possible, whether it be in ruminants, whether it be in livestock and food products, or whether it's in biorefining. So for all of those reasons, I'm very glad that you are here. Uh, please feel welcome, and uh, I uh, won't hesitate but to uh, introduce and to welcome Caroline to the floor and to uh, deliver her talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a great honour to be here. Um, I sort of started off my farming career in Wales, actually. Um, I was a YTS, which was sort of like the equivalent of an apprentice back in 1981, uh, on a dairy farm where I um, milked cows three times a day, um, uh, right down by Lampeter Velfry. And uh, it was the time of the snow, so it was quite an adventurous time being a, a dairy in dairy industry uh, at the time, and it was just as things were starting to change with quotas as well. Um, I have, I've, I've, well, uh, speaking uh, and sorting out the, the title for today, I then realised, actually, gosh, what a big challenge I've set myself. So I'm going to give you, over the next 45 minutes, a whistle-stop tour on this issue here breaking down the barriers to deliver real change to our food and farming systems. 
and really trying to look at uh, the areas that you're obviously addressing within the research in terms of sustainable intensification and uh, the importance of that at all levels, production, environment and social engagement, low carbon energy pathways, developing bioeconomy and the impacts and mitigation of ch climate change and, and human activity. Where are the trade-offs in all of this? and things like that. And how do we make trade-offs acceptable? Because if we think we can have it all, then we've got another thing coming. And so that's, you know, one of the big challenges that we've got. So I'm going to sort of break down my talk into a few different areas. What is the real change we're actually looking for? I'm married to a dairy farmer down in the southwest, down in Cornwall. And my husband will say to me, so, you know, what do you want me to do differently? Uh, and and this, is the, you know, this is the big question at all levels of actually engagement of farmers, the engagement of us as society, as individuals. Actually, what are we doing wrong now? And actually, how should we be doing it differently? So, you know, key messages, communication is going to be quite a key part. What are our farming systems? What does a farming system look like? Uh, what are our food systems? And the more I've dealt into this, in fact, I've, uh, over the last few days, I've asked Sainsbury's, I've asked farmers, I've asked individuals, and actually all of a sudden you think, oh, do we have a food system? What does our food system look like? Should we be developing a food system? So I'm going to try and embr uh, embrace and address some of these things. What are the barriers? If you want me to do something differently, how are you going to try and c overcome those changes? And what will really drive change within that? And then, of course, what does success look like? I don't know if I can fully answer that, but obviously I'll come back in 2018 and see what success looks like at the result of the project here as well. So I'm going to go to sort of really start off on this is, you know, so uh, what's, the, what's the problem? Now, this is Hurricane Katrina fascinating in terms of obviously devastating for uh, the in in New Orleans in terms of short-term aspects you know it, it flattened houses <coughs> it created real uh, challenges to the local community and it's like you know for those of you that have been in big snowstorms or been in hurricanes and things like that actually to start off with we're all very nice to each other uh, you've had a bit of a problem or oh, I see you know one of the slates gone through the window of your car uh, can we help by about sort of day three, people aren't so nice. And that's one of the challenges with climate change. You know, we're only nine meals away from anarchy. Uh, and actually, after a little bit without food, we start getting a bit grumpy. And so these are the sort of things of really, so what's the impact of climate change? And we, and we sort of, we see it there, but most of us don't deal in climate change. You don't go out every single day and think, my target today is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 10%. Or if you do, fantastic. Oh, you do, sir, do you? Do you do that? No. You do. Ah, I thought we got somebody in the audience. But those are the sort of challenges of actually how do we relate these big picture issues into small uh, type issues. The environmental uh, parameters. I don't know if you've uh, heard of Rockstrom, but this has just been updated literally uh, this uh, last month. This is, you know, we are living beyond the capability of our planet to regenerate itself in things like biodiversity, <coughs> climate change challenge, right through to the land system change. We're seeing a tremendous amount of pressure on our soils, our water, our biodiversity, phosphorus, nitrogen. And actually, if we all lived like the average North American, we'd be needing five planets to cope with the sort of utilisation of the resources that we're currently using. Now, here in Wales... Uh, and in England and in Scotland, actually we're using three planets. We cannot sustain that. We are living beyond the means of our planet to regenerate itself. This is a big challenge. And then, of course, we have the spectrum of malnutrition. And we're all somewhere along that spectrum. Um, but the challenge here is not only poverty, and I'm sure you've heard of, or heard of you know, Make Poverty History, and there's been some really big changes in this area, but actually, it's also the, the nutrient deficiencies, uh, the <coughs> fibre deficiencies. Most women will be short of calcium, zinc, and actually a lot of the vitamin Bs. Uh, men, uh, it's recommended that you have your, within your diet uh, fibre around sort of 38 grams. Average man will be eating about 17, 18 grams. Average woman, 
16 grams of fibre when we should be eating 27 grams. So these sort of challenges of actually malnutrition, it is inherent within our system. And then, of course, we have the overnutrition aspect, which is adding not only to the challenges of the non-communicable diseases, but actually, in addition to that, uh, it, it adds within the waste challenge that we have. So big challenges. And, and we have a headline target. Now, you're... Uh, achieving your aims by 2018. You would hope that you would identify new funding sources, new opportunities of having brought together more researchers to look at some of these aspects. But actually, we've got lots of headline targets that we've set on the global scale on things like a 20% reduction in premature mortality related to non-communicable diseases by 2025 in 10 years' time. Now, that's actually pretty soon. In China, an area where the Asian diet is obviously traditionally more vegetable-based, but we're starting to see an uh, increase in, the, in consumption of meats and things like that, 51% of the adult population is showing pre-diabetic symptoms. You know, that has the potential to put, again, huge pressures within the community and on a global scale as well. So these are some of the big things. And then this is... Um, this aspect, this is some photographs, in fact, from 1930. Uh, and there was a dentist called uh, Weston Price who gave up being dentistry to look at nutrition. And from him, we have learnt actually the importance of the teeth structure around nutrition. He'd identified people that had a traditional diet of seeds and um, nuts and whole grains and things like that, had a very strong formed structure of their facial features. But actually, as soon as you started introducing things like um, white breads and processed foods and things like that, you get this sort of challenge. And it happens very, very quickly. And in fact, you know, for those of you who have got children, uh, you know, increasingly we have a challenge for teeth and the structure of teeth. More and more children will be wearing braces uh, and things like that. So these are sort of all indicators for health. And then, of course, we look at diversity. Back in 1903, when you started looking at the range of the diversity of the accessions for our, our vegetable spectrum, we were talking hundreds of different commercially available seeds and varieties. You look at where we are now. Well, this, in fact, was in 1983, and it will be less now. Uh, instead of 288 beet varieties, you're talking about 17. Now, why is this diversity important? The diversity is important in terms of building the resilience for the crop, the resilience for our biodiversity, and actually there's so much we still don't know about how important these infrastructures are. And then, of course, if you look at actually our own diets, uh, in fact, 75% of the global food supply, this is across the world, comes from only 12 plants and five animal species, 75%. You know, that's incredible, of which three make up nearly 60% of our calories, which is corn, uh, wheat, and rice. Corn in the form of maize rather than obviously wheat. Uh, uh, sorry, in maize. Maize, wheat, and rice. So, you know, we are heavily reliant on incredibly few crops in terms of our diet, our infrastructure, building the resilience around how we have our farming system and our food system. And when you look on a global scale of all the things that are available, in fact, there are 30,000 edible plant species, of which, actually, you know, we consume around 150 to 200 species. Very, very small amount. So, you know, wow, what opportunity and what diversity. And then, of course, to add to how things are changing on the global scale, we see this transition of what we perceive as development. And so on the left-hand side, uh, you will see a heavy integration between producers and consumers in terms of the con producers will know the consumers. So in developing countries in particular, this will happen. So relatively low level of productivity, but all that is produced is, is, is low uh, market integration. It doesn't go much beyond actually the, uh, the location of the uh, producers and the lo much, much more local. And as we look at developing our systems of agriculture, the agricultural transformation we see, we get to where we are 
really here in the Western world. This divide between producers and consumers. And that becomes huge challenges because if you then look at the increased urbanisation, uh, people don't know about food systems. They don't know about the benefit of our food systems, the cultural value of our food systems. And that in itself brings some very big changes. And in fact, again, to take China as an example, they have set a target of encouraging uh, a, a, a managed movement of rural people into urban areas. But that isn't just several. That's 266 million rural people going into urban areas, new towns, new development. Already they have achieved that with 166 million people. You know, that's a lot of people. And with that, again, you lose the skills, the knowledge, the inherent understanding of the culture of the land and things like that. And, of course, another aspect of that is, is exercise. As we go into uh, urban areas, you sit behind a computer and we all sort of do this all day and in the office rather than actually walk around the cows. Now, I, I wear a, a, a thing called a Fitbit. I um, don't know if anybody's heard. And I know, I monitor... How many, um, how many steps I take each day, how many calories I've burnt, and how many stairs I've gone up and things like that. Now, I have today walked 3,430. As uh, a woman, uh, I should walk at least 9, 8,000, 9,000. Uh, haven't achieved that. And in fact, uh, on the days that I do achieve that, uh, it's whether you know, I'm sort of strutting around London or helping out occasionally at farm at home or things like that. It says here, in terms of the calories I've burnt, it's 1,271. Now, the recommended daily intake for a woman is 2,000 calories. I have, even if I've walked 17,000 steps, have never achieved the need to burn off 2,000 calories. So I eat more than actually, you know, my body can sort of burn. My husband, when he wears this, uh, by 9 o'clock in the morning, bearing in mind Phil gets up at half three, will have walked 9,000 steps. By the end of the day, he has walked usually at least 22,000 steps. Some days, that's 66,000 steps, uh, which is the equivalent of 22 miles. But that's because he is doing exercise an inherent part of his job. This is the big challenge and the big difference between an urban and a rural community. Now, for Phil, that means you know, more sympathy from the wife. For me, that means great experiment, Phil. Thank you very much. <laughs> So with all these things, we kind of look at the, the, the big picture aspect and you start thinking, you know, don't panic, don't panic. But actually, gosh, you know, there are some big challenges. And, and how do we make these changes in terms of our food system, but also obviously within our farming system? So, you know, what is uh, the farming system and, and how do we talk about our farming system? So you then start thinking, well, actually, how do you as individuals define a farming system? Now, <coughs> it's certainly measured at different levels, and we all have different priorities. So uh, in my work, uh, I'm very interested in integrated farm management. That's what we do at LEAF, and I'm just going to sort of introduce you to some of the concept of integrated farm management. There'll be some of you here that will be engaged in the organic farming system. Again, a defined farming system. Then you move into conventional systems. And in fact, that becomes sort of more loose in terms of what are the parameters. If somebody said, I'm a conventional farmer, what does that actually mean? And then, of course, you could, uh, and I had this discussion with my husband at the weekend. So for him, uh, what is his farming system? Well, it's maximizing milk production from grass. Uh, for many of you here, if you're farming or looking at other farming systems, it'll be, again, maximising meat from grass or optimising the opportunity of, of my cropping within a, a set location and things like that, maybe going for mixed farming. But actually, this is really important, is, is if you're looking for change within a system, it's actually defining what is the system and how you can deliver different parts of change as well. So for us, this is where integrated farm management is about. So I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to what we do as an organisation. But we're a, a global organisation working with farmers, industry, science, and that's something that's, you know, colleges and universities that's really important for us. Um, and we're not a large organisation. We employ 12 members of staff. But the strength of what we do is our demonstration farms, our reach out really through farms and also through lecturers and through 
other students and things like that, in encouraging and inspiring change, because ultimately, you know, this is what it's all about. So this is our vision, a world that is eating, farming, and living sustainably. Now, that's, you know, it's, it's uh, a vision that I think everybody can buy into, because this is about what are we actually trying to deliver as an organisation. Well, we want farming <coughs> to be sustainable, we want actually the food that we eat to be sustainable, and we want our experience in how we do business, how we work as people, as individuals, to be sustainable as well. So this is the sort of the approach we take with integrated farm management. And I don't know if anybody's ever been to Cirque du Soleil, but uh, you get jugglers there, and the guys there can juggle about nine balls at any one time. And that's what a farmer has to do absolutely every single day. Um, because there will be always a different perspective, a different weather forecast, a different challenge. You know, not dealing with climate change, but dealing with weather, priorities, time scale, disease incidences, pest incidences, and things like that. So it brings in, within our definition of the farming system, a framework for actually the whole farm, looking at soil management, crop health, energy use, pollution control, waste management, biodiversity, of course, water management, community engagement. Um, if you're going to be doing all these wonderful things, are you telling people about it? Or if you're just telling people about it, have you got the evidence behind you to demonstrate that you're doing something that's worthwhile? And that's something that's very, very key for us. And we've divided our activities into three core areas. The knowledge, the technical aspects of integrated farm management, the market opportunity, and then the public engagement. And this is built over the years that we've recognised that if you really want people to change, you've got to understand what it is you want to change, what it is in terms of actually encouraging that level of change, um, to communicating it, and then also working together and pulling it with the market. And if those areas don't actually sort of... Is that a mouse we have in the corner? A bird. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little bit of biodiversity in there. <laughs> um, and, and so for us, driving that change is very key. And so uh, certainly adapting integrated farm management, the adoption of it is moving things forward. This is about change. You don't get to sustainability and, and say, you know, way I, I've, you know, I've made sustainability. It's that continual development, continual aspect of change. You know, it's a bit like saying, you know, if, if I say, oh, my relationship with my husband is sustainable. Well, you know, that's kind of dull. Sustainable is very sort of, yeah, it should be more than sustainable. And that's the challenge of sustainability. It's that continual dynamic process of delivering change. So creating that re best performance shift on a regular basis is something that's very key. So for us, we have a network of demonstration farms. We don't have one in Wales, which is a shame. Uh, we'd certainly be interested uh, over time. Uh, we have innovation centres, which is research institutes and things like that. We have technical tools, so we have uh, self-assessment, leaf sustainable farming review, right through, through to guidelines and online information centres. But the real area of what helps change is farmers learning from other farmers and actually making sure the messages that we're looking to drive change are practical, realistic and achievable in terms of the bite-sized areas. So we know that as a result of uh, visiting an event, would, uh, we asked farmers, would you change your practices? 11%, yeah, we will, straight away, having seen what we're going to do. 80% probably after taking advice, and then 9%, no, we're, we're there. Um, but I think, you know, that's something that is, we're trying to build evidence about what it is we want people to change and then actually also saying, well, are you going to change because of you've seen what we're doing? And we're now increasingly actually looking at sustainability monitoring and this is a huge challenge. Over the sort of the last 23 and a half years that I've been working for LEAF, um, I have seen no end of different sets of indicators that have been developed. So the government will set a, 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 some sustainability indicators, and then after about five years, they'll set a new set of indicators. And this is the real challenge for actually looking at managing and developing change, of being consistent, robust, and knowing what you're looking to actually drive change. And because uh, since 1993, we have actually looked at 
um, we've monitored farms through the processes of what they're doing. We know that actually farmers have, have improved their farming practices, have challenged their farming practices, and have sometimes have also reduced in terms of their capabilities. So energy is a really good example. Back in 1998, when we were asking farmers about energy efficiency, that would be how much energy do you use, how many diesel, how much electricity do you use? And so when we started then getting into the 2000s, the debate around energy has become very, very different. It's about renewables. It's about greenhouse gas emissions. So all of a sudden, what was the target that was growing in terms of the 90s suddenly dropped significantly because the parameters by which we were all measuring or looking at a particular problem became incredibly different. And that's something that's really important in terms of delivering change. It's not always going to be success. And it's learning from the mistakes, learning from the, the ups and the downs, the lows and the highs that actually also help form change, form new ideas and, and obviously break innovation as well. And then, of course, alongside that, because our farmers were sort of saying, yeah, well, this is good, we're doing some good things, we'd like to show it. And the public that we were taking out onto farm wanted to see that as well. So we developed the leaf mark. And in fact, now 22% uh, of UK fruit and veg will be leaf mark accredited. We've only got four leaf mark growers in Wales. It'd be lovely to have more. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the sort of, we're starting to see, particularly in the fresh produce, sector a real growth and movement of farmers that are meeting the criteria demanded of what is an environmental sustainability standard with independent external verification. So we've seen you know, a, a big growth in terms of the number of farms that are certified uh, and in addition to that um, the area that's certified too and so that's a good opportunity. And then, of course, we've uh, been developing public trust and understanding and, and back in 2006 we hosted our first Open Farm Sunday. Has anybody ever here ever done Open Farm Sunday? No. Oh, well, good opportunity then this year. 7th of June, uh, go out if you uh, haven't been out before or otherwise host an event. Um, but we now have had, probably over the last sort of nine years, some 1,000 farmers that have hosted an Open Farm Sunday event. And so there's a rotational basis on this, around 390 farmers a year. And the results of people going out on Open Farm Sunday, around 200,000 people each year going out onto farm. Over nine years, that's been over 1.25 million people. So this year is our 10th year, and it would be really good to see more Welsh farms <coughs> opening up on Open Farm Sunday. But this is about engaging the public in helping them understand the story behind food, the story and appreciation of farmers, the opportunity of encouraging people to actually go down the route of being in the farming industry as well. You know, I'm, I'm not originally a, a, from a farming family. My, my father was a deep sea diver. And, you know, what inspired me was some of the, the things that were happening around where, um, when I was a little girl. In fact, what it was, gosh, it's so old. Um, back in 1967, I had mumps and my grandparents lived in the Isle of Wight. So I was sent over to the Isle of Wight to recuperate and uh, all the cattle that were in the fields around suddenly disappeared overnight. And for me, that was like really, you know, a little girl was really shocking, and that was that opportunity of, gosh, how do we change things? And uh, so, but it's, it's different things that will inspire different people. And if you get a child out onto the farm before the age of 11, you have got a lifelong appreciation and understanding of nature. That is something that's, you know, proven time and time again. So this, this public engagement is really key and, and we should be using every trick in the book, whether it be communicating in the pub, notice boards, virtual farm walk we have, uh, and then we've done another project which I'll come on to in a minute as well. But what's driven the real change and what drives the real change in anything <coughs> is a shock to the system. And so, you know... With Open Farm Sunday, with our demonstration farms, we were doing okay. 20,000 people went out onto farm each year. It was sort of ticking along. But actually, it was the real shock to the system of foot and mouth when the countryside was closed that really was the tipping point in getting people to think, oh, hang on a minute, we want people out into our countryside. And then the public thinking, actually, farmers are good people. So that's driven the change. 
And actually, this is, this is, you know, when you hear about all those sort of facts and figures that I've given you just beforehand, you know, these are big things. We should be panicking, but actually... We're not. We're okay. You know, we can still fill up our cars with diesel. We can still have plenty of food from the supermarkets and things like that. So the real drive for the tipping point is a big challenge. So actually trying to find our own tipping points or our own ways of trying to deliver change is something that we really need to be mindful of because, boy, do they drive change very fast. Um, and so I, I've just talked about that. But, you know... This is why it's so critical to understand what are we looking to drive change and what do we actually try and, and understand. And for us, when we take people out onto Open Farm Sunday, it's families. We don't get 16 to 18-year-olds going out on Open Farm Sunday. We get children with parents or grandparents. And that's, that's fantastic. Uh, and that's the audience. And they learn something new. 85% learn something new. Um, I think we all, let, well, gosh, we all continually learn something new. You know, it shouldn't be a day that goes past where you haven't learned something new. But actually, to get somebody learning something new that you really want them to understand, of course, in the university here, uh, everybody's learning lots of new things every day, as particularly the students. But it is that driving of what it is you want really people to, to learn, appreciate, and change. And one of the things that we did uh, some six and a half years ago was actually recognise... Open Farm Sunday brings out the people that are, it's relatively straightforward to get out onto farm. Um, and so what are, you know, this is the breaking down of the barriers. What are the barriers that actually prevent people that have either a disability or are actually um, completely denied the opportunity of going out onto farm? How do you drive them out onto farm? How do you encourage them? Build trust, build understanding. Because sometimes, you know, farming, dangerous um, it's got sort of, ooh, you know, diseases occasionally, it's muddy, it's dirty, it's wet. But actually, you know, those are not barriers about farming. And when you start getting people out onto farm, they think, whoa, mud's fun, uh, mud's soil, soil's great. You know, no end of arable farmers will say, well, we can get people out onto farm, but it's a bit, you know, we haven't got much to show them because we haven't got livestock. Well, you've got tractors, you've got worms you've got hundreds of worms you know you can put a worm on a piece of glass and you can hear it walking or moving you know all the sort of the delight of nature and the opportunities of what we have out in the countryside so we've have done a lot of work on developing now sensory rich farms so we've worked with around 90 or so farms uh, where we have a small area which is is very sensory rich now, I'm sure you would have all heard of the new 4D cinemas. I think there's one in Manchester and things like that, where you get water chucked at you and smells and gas and things like that. Um, and that's what a farm is. It's, it's better than a 4D cinema because you have everything. You smell, the taste, the touch, the sights, the lot. And, and what we've found out, certainly from working with people who have disability through autism or blind and things like that, it's been a huge learning curve for farmers and it's been a huge learning curve for actually building trust. And you know, people with dementia in particular get them out onto farm and actually a lot of the spirit, the well-being aspects are lifted incredibly. And this is, you know, this, this is proven time and time again and this is... The health and well-being aspects of farming are completely denied. You know, we really still don't look at those. But for farmers, it's been great because they've suddenly realised, gosh, they have got a lot more touchy-feely farm than, uh, than they thought they had. And in addition to that, it's, it's taught them to communicate more effectively. Because most farmers, if I've, if I've got my landscape behind me now, and I'm a farmer standing and talking to you guys as my audience, you can bet your bottom dollar that I will then turn around and talk to my landscape out here. Now, if you're deaf, then you can't see my lips anymore. You won't be able to see my, my facial features and anything. So it's made farmers actually start thinking about new ways of communicating about, about what we do and how we do it and, and very clearly. So that's a little bit about the farming system. So what is the food system? Now, I've taken this from Oxford University. The food system can include all those activities involving the production, processing, transport and consumption of food. And actually, that, you know, that really does encompass when you start sort of looking theoretically and academically at the food system, that's what the food system is. But as an individual, I don't live in that food system. 
I am a consumer. And the choices of a transport or food production, some of that's made through labelling, but actually we're quite far removed of it. And changing or enhancing that food system is, is quite a large challenge. And it includes things like the governance and the economics of food production, its sustainability, and to the degree which we waste food. So I'm, I just want to sort of talk a little bit about uh, a study that I uh, fortunately did um, last year. Uh, I got an Uffield scholarship, and my topic was what can farmers learn from science to improve the nutrition of our food? Because actually when you start looking at food and at farmers, many farmers will say, well, I produce a commodity. Don't, we produce food. When you start looking at nutrition, now I know quite a bit about cow nutrition, pig nutrition, chicken nutrition. Uh, when it comes to people, agriculturally trained, I know very little about human nutrition. I know a lot more now, but actually that's a big failing. So as farmers, we're not actually producing food to go into the food system. And when you look at the moment, you know, I've got 9 billion people. I was going to see if I could get away with that, actually, it's saying that, but I've said it's bad. 50% uh, increase in production by 2050. More food. It's not about just more food. It's about the right food, the right diet, the nutritional enhancement area. So actually, you know, what is it that as farmers... Uh, we have a, a, you know, a part to play within that. And as researchers, and I think this is going to be a fundamental question within some of your research as well, is, is actually what is the future that we're trying to achieve looking like? If we have a low carbon economy, um, really what is that about within the food system and sustainable intensification and the trade-offs? So I went, uh, went to Toronto, Taipei, uh, Wageningen University and uh, other parts within Europe but the more I, I found out, you know, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. And uh, yes, I, <laughs> I realised how little I knew when it came to food. But I did take the pizza as a proxy. So there are only 10 meals that the average people will eat on a rotational basis uh, every week, week in, week out, of which the pizza is one. Uh, and so when you look at the pizza, you then start breaking it down into its constituent parts well, the great thing back in, in wheat, uh, on your base part, you have, uh, in 2013, they looked at the full genome sequence for wheat. Really exciting opportunity, because you can then start looking at, actually, what are the issues? You know, I mentioned about fibre. Can we use and enhance the fibre content in the part of the grain that doesn't necessarily go as the whole grain? Can we look at other nutrient values and nutrient enhancements within that breeding program? So you think, oh, this is good news, fantastic work that's going on right across the universities here in the UK on a global scale, brilliant work that's going on in, um, in Taiwan. Um, and then you start thinking epigenetics. You meet somebody who comes along and talks about epigenetics. Now, i would not really heard about epigenetics. Um, I'm sure many of you probably know all about it. Um, but then you think, right, okay, well, we've now got our genes all sorted, so let's talk about epigenetics. So if you can imagine your computer and the hardware is your, like, your sort of your basic DNA and things like that, and what the epigenetics is, is then the software. And this is then becomes the confusion of actually what makes things work. So if you think your gene's going to work, this is how it's going to carry forward, um, you then say, well, there are environmental aspects, there's how your parents ate, how your grandparents ate, because all of those have the capability to turn each one of the genes that make the component part of us uh, into, um, into the sort of the factors and the, and the bits of what we'll take forward. So it's, it's a bit like a dimmer switch, you know, a gene can be switched totally on, or it can be partly on or partly off, and, and that again brings huge amounts of challenge. So I then sort of took, right, tomatoes. Now, there's been some wonderful work done, tomatoes in, in GM production, plant breeding production in America. They're taking the volatiles of tomatoes and then selecting those volatiles for breeding to select the flavor. Now, uh, you then think, well, gosh, of course, that's, that's obvious. But as a child, we're all told, you know, hold your nose and down it goes when it's something you don't really want to eat. Well, it's because, actually, the flavour really comes from the volatiles, from the smell. And if you can enhance the flavour, you then encourage, actually, ultimately, people to eat more tomatoes. 
if you can then start bringing into their other nutrient aspects, again, a really important part. And of course, there's been fantastic work being done in the milk sector as well, around uh, things like saturated fats and enhancing, uh, well, lowering um, unsaturated fat levels within cheese. So you sort of, you start then looking at actually starting to change the pizza. And in fact, um, within uh, Glasgow uh, um, Royal Infirmary, uh, they have developed a perfectly nutritionally balanced pizza. Fantastic. And then over on the right, NASA have recently developed for your trip out to Mars, the 3D printed pizza. Again, nutritionally balanced. So you start thinking, hmm, okay, is this what I want? Is this the, the processed aspect of, of it? Or is there opportunity to try and bring some of this back pre-farm gate? Because if we just as a farming industry produce commodities, then actually the opportunity is for the processors to add the nutrition post-farm gate. And ultimately we should be drawing this back pre-farm gates, because if you have a nutrition which is inherently um, part of the, uh, the food, then it is much more effectively taken up by the body. So very really important. And this has been developed uh, far more in this kind of health by stealth effect in how places like New Zealand are communicating this. So at the bottom you can see vital immunity, vital heart, vital sight, vital bones, challenging the consumer to start recognising you are eating food for your health and actually the importance of food, not as a fuel, but actually for health. Uh, uh, right through to the Beneforti broccoli. Um, but this has highlighted a very big challenge around labelling. So anybody who took things like Actimel and stuff like that, you'll see all the, uh, the claims around healthy um, bacteria and stuff like that has, has now gone, because it also is the same for super broccolis and things like that, which were starting to demonstrate some incredibly enhanced nutritional value for health. That's disappeared. So we have, you know, we've, we've got legislative challenges coming forward in these sort of areas. But, you know, these are some of the ways of moving forward. If we can, if we can enhance the packaging, if we can enhance the foods, we then look at other ways of behaviour. Because if as a consumer, you're not going to change the habit because it's much easier, uh, to buy the same sort of thing year, day in, day out. And I think something like 80% of us will buy the same sort of product sequence day, week in, week out in terms of what we buy from the supermarkets. So are there other ways of influencing? And this is some wonderful work that's been gone, going on at, um, at Wageningen University, the restaurant of the future, where people are, as they go in, they're... Uh, they're weighed, uh, they're, it's, and it's, it, this, is, this is research by observation with, without comment. So they don't, they don't bear um, comment on individuals, but they look at behaviour change. Different lighting, looking at, uh, you know, if it's bright and sunny in there, everybody wants a salad. If it's grey, you know, oh God, that soup looks nice and warm and cosy and the impact of that sort of thing right through to uh, different choices. And they, they've worked a lot with reducing salt in, in, in soups and things like that. Uh, and, and at what level, all of a sudden, does the taste become just too bland for people not to want to buy it? So, uh, which is you know, quite substantial. This is all product, um, products of editing, in effect. So that's been incredibly important in terms of understanding some of the nudging of what drives change. Or... Actually, this, uh, for those of you that are students, I don't know, has anybody ever heard of Soylent? Soylent Green. Sorry? So Soylent Green, the film. Oh, the film. Ah, oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yes, no, that's... Um, but no, Soylent is uh, a completely nutritionally balanced um, package. So this has been developed in America for students because you haven't got time to work uh, to sort of to cook or anything like that you've got to work all the time work sorry you've got lots of time to work uh, more time to work uh it's it's cheaper uh and it's nutritionally balanced totally nutritionally balanced you don't eat food in this system and in fact uh i went and uh, thought right well I'll, I'll have a look at this because my sort of year alongside my work was looking quite experimental which i continue to do and uh, there is a four to five month waiting list to purchase this stuff. 
Uh, so, gosh, I mean, just imagine from a farmer's point of view if you had a four to five month waiting list on products. Fantastic. So, you know, this is a challenge uh, in terms of understanding the food culture and why we value food and why the food system is something that has many facets and has to be clearly defined. And this is another area. And in fact, when I was in Taipei uh, talking with some of the research scientists there, they were, were talking about the, the sort of the chip, the, the, mic, the personalized microchip. So Alfie, our, our cattle dog, has a microchip. Um, and, uh, you know, that sort of keeps him from sometimes running away. <laughs> He's got a top speed of 35 miles an hour. But this is looking at the, uh, the personalized area. This is a, a contact lens, and within here is actually a glucose sensor. And from that, if you are diabetic, you can then actually record on your phone um, what your glucose levels are. So this is getting into much more the sort of the personalized aspect and the, the opportunity of developing personalized um, health uh, areas as well. It's a big growth area, as is the functional foods, the biofortified foods, the nutritionally enhanced foods. You know, uh, throughout Asia now, when you look at the, the sheer range of milk products, water products, um, veg products, of, of what are nutritionally enhanced um, through specific nutrients and, and things like that. So very, very key. So this is all, you know, you can, you can kind of under the radar look at double change or you can be much more blatant of driving change. And, and I think with food, we should be looking much more actually being far more blatant because ultimately it's about the culture and things like that around it. So when you look at behavior change, this is some work that was done in America on soya. If you don't tell people about anything for them to change, they're not going to change because there's no particular reason it becomes a random choice for change. If you then talk about uh, attributes, so if you eat this, it will make, um, it, it's got uh, lovely healthy aspects. It's high in calcium, it's high in omega-3 or something like that. So that will change behavior a little bit. If you talk about the consequence only and say, right, if you eat this, you'll live longer. You'll have less incidence of heart disease. Again, you know, that will get people changing and thinking a little bit more. But actually, if you start bringing together the attribute, this contains calcium, it's, and uh, the consequence, you'll have stronger bones, actually, that drives the changing behavior. That's, that's about communication. It's a bit like the five fruit and veg, and you know, getting me to walk 9,000 steps on a daily basis. If you tell me from going from, say, an average of five or 6,000 steps to go 9,000 steps, it doesn't work. If you tell me, why don't you set a target of walking 500 steps more every month, you know, that's going to drive change. If I'm only eating, you know, five fruit and veg, okay, and I only eat two fruit and veg, for example, you know, one fruit and one veg, to tell me to eat five, it's not going to drive change. But say, why don't you eat one more fruit? Why don't you eat one more veg? That's what drives change. So it's, it's being very, very more um, developmental. And I, and I think from looking at a lot of the work in terms of looking at the community be benefits of wellness, versus the isolation of illness has been something that's been really key. We tend to focus on health and lack of health on a, a, a sort of a very sort of pointed finger type approach rather than actually recognizing it as an opportunity for a much better community approach. And there's been some wonderful examples in France, in Denmark, where actually the whole community have been led often by the mayor or um, somebody in the local community to drive real change. And um, one of the things in South Korea, this is astounding facts. Back in 1980, they were recognizing that their diet was looking to go down the Western world uh, approach. They were worried about that. They didn't think that they could afford that. And with a lot of initiatives, including government and industry uh, campaigns, this is an astounding fact. They have increased their fruit production to 300% more fruit and 10% more vegetables from two, uh, 1980 to 2009. Um, now, that's, you know, not only is that a growth, but actually it's also been a maintenance. So it hasn't, you know, the, the food system has moved forward on a principally veg-related diet with obviously um, some meat. But I, but I think, you know, this change is possible. 
So, you know, the key driver on any of this is clarity. Clearness of the message. What do you want me to do different? What are we saying? Um, and, and really trying to mainstream change is, is driving this whole active participation, <coughs> integrating it into people's everyday lives and moving forward. And then looking at some of the government's aspects. Has everybody heard of the Millennium Development Goals? They're great. Um, a lot of people haven't still. Uh, and obviously... They are due to be completed uh, by this year. So they were all set as targets in 2000, which at the time didn't really seem a very long, well, seemed a long time ago to get to now. Um, and there's been amazing factors done in terms of driving change, but, but more needs to be done. And what's being done now is the development of the sustainable development goals. So FAO are just striving for those changes. But this is the governance. These are the big picture aspects of what drives change? What are the priorities? These are, you know, make poverty history, eradicate hunger, uh, build up <coughs> nutrition. And these are the sort of the key drivers that actually are very key in looking further down in terms of the change. And part of the development of the sustainable development se sector is really looking, what are the priorities? The importance of women. 60% of the world's farmers are, st are women. If women were given access uh, to the um, education and finance that men were, particularly in developing countries, we would see a 20% reduction in waste, um, purely because of the, the importance of the social integration, the family integration. Health, key, social aspects, development aspects, poverty, work, water. You know, these are the key things of understanding what is the world going to look like in another 15 years. So for us, uh, and, and certainly for me personally as well, food is quite a key vehicle in driving change. So any farming system has to be looking and using food as the medium for driving that change because we need to enhance health and we need to really build that aspect forward. But it's all about diversity too. And, uh, you know, eat the colour of the rainbows. That does not mean eat a packet of Skittles. It does mean the importance of the diversity in our, in our diets is something that's very, very key. So I, I think the big question around this behaviour change is in striving to produce more, have we lost the perspective of the nutritional value of food? And um, I think it's something that is a very big challenge and I think within your portfolio of research I think it's something that you should certainly have uh, within the, your mind because the opportunity of biodiversity, the opportunity of enhancing health, the opportunity of added value to farmers lies within actually food and the, the importance of food and I think the big concern is that farmers are not around the table in the debate. Um, I, I, you know, in every sort of bit, and, I, and I've obviously recently, just before coming here, looked at the health priorities for Wales, and uh, it, was, it was great. It was bringing pra uh, practitioners, i.e. doctors, and nutritionists together, fantastic. But where were farmers in that? You know, where was the drive for enhancing the nutritional value of, of milk? Where was the drive for encouraging growth in our vegetable production? Um, whether it be here in Wales, the potato production, obviously, you know, a critical part of, of, of um, southwest Wales, right through to the, you know, those real opportunities. And I believe that health is kind of where the environment was 20 years ago. So actually the environment is an increasingly an inherent part of how we do business. You know, it's, we understand quite a lot more about biodiversity, but we understand very little really about health. Um, Tim Brocklehurst from um, the Institute of Food Research told me a fantastic little f um, fact which was actually we're only 10% human because when you start looking at all the activity of the, the bugs within our own stomachs you realise the cell density of the bugs in our stomachs is, is the 90% of our cells and DNA. What, a, what an interesting thought. So, you know, there are key roles of food, farming and nature and I think it's really going to be important. This is, this is not a competition. This is working together to develop a fully integrated farming, food, education plan based around nutrition because that's key. We need to embed health as a value of when we buy food as individuals. 
it's not just food it's you know that key part and we need to create much more diversity and I think this Chinese proverb he that takes medicine and neglects diet wastes the skills of the physician is really key and you'll see at the bottom here you've got a little guinea pig and that's a really important part now, part of that was the experimentation the importance of experimentation uh, in, in what we do and how we do how we challenge how we question everything we do and uh, Phil and my daughter Gabrielle kind of had to experience a lot of, uh, of being guinea pigs over the last year as I looked at different food systems, food types, uh, tried preserving food. Um, I haven't really quite mastered the preserving of cabbage and things like that quite effectively, and my curing on the fish was disgusting. Uh -huh. um, but, it, you know, these are the things you have to, to experiment about. But they're also really important, the, as I learned, was the uh, guinea pig has the same lipid constitution as, as us as humans, and hence, you know, you sort of always say guinea pig. But they are incredibly important. So really just, uh, you know, I have given a, a very broad brush, but, you know, what is the real change that we are looking for? Uh, we have some really big challenges, and the real change that we're looking forward to, to do is to deliver against those challenges, but at a local level, at a practical level, in bite-sized pieces that add up to the whole. And that's, you know, that's what will make individuals change, um, because we're all different and we all have different priorities. What are our farming systems? I think you know, this needs to be very clearly defined in the, in the communication that we have with individuals and farmers and things like that, very, again, very key. And what are our food systems? I would argue we have not, we haven't really got our head around this at all. And uh, we don't have workable food systems and there's something that we do need to really develop because they're going to be important. And we as industry, uh, the farming industry, need to be sitting around the table in the development of those food systems because it shouldn't just be um, the retailers, government and doctors and nutritionists. It needs to be the practitioners. Barriers, gosh, there are a lot of them, but they are overcome, you know, they can be overcome. If we make the system easy, if we communicate clearly, if we encourage the market drivers, if we kind of create it kind of health by stealth, and finally, if it all fails, if we legislate, uh, those are the sort of the key ways of, of driving change. And what does success look like? Well, I mean, I think it would be really trying to see us keeping in check some of the, the consequences of climate change and our food habits and our food systems as it constantly sand. So um, I've given a very quick whistle-stop tour around a lot of issues, but thank you very much. <laughs> Questions?